alhamdulillah wa salat wa salam Allah wa rasulullah uh, welcome to our akita class guys and uh today uh we're going to be completing volume one of the book diluting well well better this will be the completion of volume one the last few pages and again these last eight chapters of volume one really served as an introduction to volume two i've given you guys enough time where inshallah everybody should have received volume two you should have ordered it by now from amazon because we will begin volume two which of uh, the diluting well or well better uh, tomorrow and let me show you guys again what that looks like volume two it looks just like volume one but it's more in depth more more uh it's over 500 and some pages this was 300 over 300 pages well the other book is more intense than this it's over 500 pages and it looks just like the blue book except it's red so you purchase it on amazon.com you go to amazon.com and, and uh, uh purchase the book it's 19.99 it says diluting el wella well better the unveiled trilogy volume two and this volume will focus in on what we've been discussing uh how to awaken our faith how to develop increase our iman increase our love for allah our fear of his punishment and our hope of his mercy when we're living in an environment that is not faith filled and that means not just living in the west but a lot of you muslims live in muslim countries like pakistan malaysia you live in united arab emirates you know but still we're surrounded by people who are not practicing this religion correctly because unfortunately most muslims today do not have a true understanding of la ilaha illallah muhammad or rasulullah so it's hard for us to maintain our iman and allah will test us he'll put us to the test to see just how strong we are by sending hardships to us and this is where muslims lose it today we lose it we fail to understand that Allah tells us, just like he told the companions, he said, just because you say you believe in me, I know that that may not be true. So I am going to send tests to you just to see if you really do believe in me and how you handle those trials how you handle those tests will determine if you are a true believer in me or if you are a hypocrite and as we can see all the muslims are being tested and tried with what's going on in the world over in gaza that's a, there's a lot going on over there it's it's horrific but it's nothing new it really isn't it's nothing new it's been going on for centuries over there and not just there look what happened in bosnia have you guys forgot what happened in bosnia that was just in the early 2000s the same genocide the same thing they were trying to they were killing the women the children raping them the women that they allowed to live they raped them to try to impregnate them the same genocide so this is nothing new okay but allah sends war and stuff like this if you look there's a pattern there's a pattern when did that stuff in bosnia happen in the early 2000s then after that burma burma the, the muslims in burma have been uh persecuted raped killed uh genocided uh since the, when did that start in 2014 and then china what when did it start with china 2018 if you guys see there's a pattern here allah is sending these type of trials to test to see who are like he said to see who amongst us is really strong in our iman because if you're strong in your faith 
strong in your belief, you would do what the prophet said, which is uh, you will recognize the signs of Allah and become even more uh, uh, godly in your actions, meaning more righteous in your actions, more righteous in, the, in your actions, and you would make better choices for yourselves, okay? But instead of us doing that, the majority of us, when we see calamities like what happened in Bosnia, when we see what happened in Burma, when we see what happened in China, when we see what happens in, in, in uh, the Sudan, when we see what's happening in Somali, then when we see what's happening in big scale like they're doing with Gaza, instead of us recognizing that Allah is trying to tell us something, we end up panicking. We end up apostating. We end up questioning a law, throwing in the town, running around like a chicken with, without a head, you know, suffering. We can't sleep. We can't eat. We can't function. Function. Oh, Allah, just take me away. Sign that you're weak. Okay. Everything is heartbreaking. When one of the nations hurt, we all do. And I'm telling y'all, what's happening in Gaza is no different. It's no different than Bosnia. See, my, many of y'all uh, were, were, weren't living. My sister-in-law is from Bosnia. I remember her and her family coming here as refugees to America. She was one of my students on my website. She was only 16, 15 years old because they were genociding the Bosnians the same way they doing the Gazians, but even a little bit worse because they were raping. They were impregnating the women. They were keeping the young girls like my sister-in-law alive and raping them, gang raping them, raping them, raping them, raping them to impregnate them. It was sick. I remember that. That Bosnian stuff was just as sick, just as sick as Gaza. It's really no difference. It was the same stuff, same Zionists. These were Zionists too. What they doing in Burma ain't no different than what they doing in Gaza. It's the same thing. Do y'all know where the Muslim Chinese are? They're in concentration camps. Same thing. Zionists work the same way. So what's happening in Gaza is no worse. It really isn't no worse than what's happening to all the other Muslims. It's just that the, uh, the, uh, the world is giving y'all more coverage of Gaza because America is really behind Gaza. You just see more. You don't see what's happening in China. You don't see what those people are going through in Burma. And you probably don't remember Bosnia. I do. It was sick. Okay? So this is what happens to all of us guys. And this is what separates us as Muslims. And I want y'all to understand that we have to rid ourselves of this misplaced allegiance. We're not supposed to be more sympathetic to one part of the world and less sympathetic to the others. As Muslims, we are one nation, one ummah, and we're like one body. If one of us hurts, we all do. And this is where many of you are transgressing the limits. A lot of you are transgressing the limits about what's going on with Gaza because it's publicized a lot because America's proud of that. This is America's baby. Obama started it and y'all, when y'all voted him and he sent all them weapons over there. So you see more of it because this is America's baby. Bosnia was a different uh, part of the world where different Zionists were taking charge. But it's no different. We have to have the same empathy for those Muslims in China, those Muslims in Burma, those Muslims in the Sudan, those Muslims in Nigeria, those Muslims in Somalia, those Muslims in Ghana that we have for Gaza. Y'all understand that? Y'all 
Y'all understand that? That's why I will better. We have to set aside that nationalism. We have to set aside that racism and come together as one. We are one nation, one people. Y'all understand that? Exactly, even here in America. Do y'all know the racism that's going on here in America against Muslims? Muslims are being persecuted here too. Unfortunately, by more Muslims instead of the Zionists. <laughs> SubhanAllah. You know, so anyway, Allah, the bottom line, Allah sends trials. He sends these hardships to test us, to see which of us are true in our belief in him and which of us are hypocritical. And for those of you who do look at yourselves and find hypocrisy in your heart, then you need to work on cleaning it, cleansing it, you know, getting rid of it. When you see that you're questioning the law or you're showing racism or, or nationalism to one group over another, the fact that you recognize this is the first step in changing yourself. Then you got to work and make the other change. Until we are united as one, we'll never succeed as a nation. And by the way, just to let you guys know, I put a video out. As, uh, sister, um, let me see if I can put that up here too. Um, how many of you saw the new uh, Sooner Followers uh, video uh, that um, was put out, that I, I put out last night, uh, Sister, um, Wait a minute, let me see if I can find it. I'm talking to y'all and what did I do? Please don't let me be under, you know, I got a problem. I'm OCD and I can't stand even my desktop to be junky. Let's pray I didn't delete uh, delete that video. I thought I was up, oh, here it is, I found it. Let me upload it to here. How many of you saw the video that I put out this morning uh, with the new ad for our website, trying to advertise our website. Uh, alhamdulillah, that video, uh, the sound, the sound, by the way, it's not music. Music is haram. We all know that. That's not music. There's no musical instruments in any of that. That's in, the, in nothing that y'all hear me putting out. So we have to, again, instead of being so critical of each other and so jealous, cause that's what it is. Why are Muslims critical of one another? Why do Muslims like to tear each other down? Because we suffer with jealousy. Ain't my fault that you got issues of jealousy. So you wanna sit there and try to tear down the, the efforts of another Muslim. There's no musical instruments. And by the way, musical instruments are haram in Islam. Poetry is not. Even our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, loved poetry. Okay? And that's all that is that you hear. Okay? It's some, something put together by the kids. And Sister Geechee, and by the way, who is Sister Geechee? That's my ex Rough Rider. I done told y'all, told y'all I got the Rough, one of the Rough Riders here. Y'all probably too young to know who or what the Rough Riders are, were. What's his name? He's gone. <laughs> What's his name, Fresno? You know, I friends know I ain't never been here listening to me. But anyway, we got one of the Rough Riders here. She the one that put that together with the kids. Hey, where is her picture at? Don't I got the Rough Rider girl picture in here? Where's Geechee's picture? Girl, I tell y'all, I just, this website just keeps me going. Y'all just don't know how stressed out I am with y'all. But anyway, yeah, so did y'all see the um the new advertisement for our website that uh, uh, Sister Geechee put out? Her and her son, there's no music in it. There she is. This is Geechee. There, there she is. Our jingle writer, Jean-Louis. Hello. 
She's from Haiti. Jean-Louis, straight out of Brooklyn. Hello, Rough Rider. Straight out of Brooklyn. <laughs> well, she is straight out of Brooklyn. Okay, she put that together. Let me see if I can play it for y'all, for those of you who haven't heard it. Okay, you hadn't heard it, sister. The sister here said, Layla, I want to see it. Okay, you, <laughs> you want to see it? Okay, here you go. Uh, let me put it on for y'all who haven't seen it. Yeah, she put this together. And there's no musical instruments in here. This is from Suna Follower. This is from Sheikh Solid. We need to unite. Sisters, wear your hijab. Wear your beards. Be proud of your beards. Stay home, stay home, stay in your home. Stand up, unite, and stand for others who pay to Adla. That's right, Solly. We all should stand up in solidarity, not transgressing the limits of the law, but standing together with patience and understanding. This is still the following. With dignity, humility, and balance. That's the part I like. With dignity, Humility and balance. That's what I'm always teaching y'all. I'm always emphasizing to y'all that as Muslims, as Muslims, we are a people of dignity. We are a people of humility and balance. And that's something that we guys are going to have to understand. So there's no music in that. That's put together by my Rough Rider, okay? Hello and the babies. Check it out, share it, we're being tested. These are the days of 10. We are being tested by a law. Where's your dignity? Where's your humility? Are you balanced? Are you allowing your anger to transgress the limits of a law or are you balancing that anger out? Are you allowing your hatred to transgress the limits of a law, or are you real wielding it in and balancing it out? Are you sisters wearing your hijabs? Are you wearing your hijabs? Are you dressing the part? Where's your abaya? Where's your overgarment? That's the dress of the Muslim women. We wear our kimars. Allah says, draw your veils over your bosom like mine is, like those women in Gaza's are. We wear our hijabs over our bosom, not tucked in like a turban, which is haram, because a turban is a dress for a man anyway. And when we leave the house, we have an overgarment on. That's what the word abaya means, an overgarment that will cover up our skin and the shape of our women parts. That's dignity. You wanna help the Muslims that are suffering around the world. You wanna show your solidarity to them. Then adapt the Islamic personality. Adapt the Muslim identity. We are women who are proud to be Muslim. We don't compromise our faith. We don't sugarcoat our faith. And we're not looking for the acceptance of any human being for what we stand for. We are people of dignity, humility, balance. We live amongst you. We don't go around picking fights. As long as you don't pick one with us, we respect your laws. As long as your laws don't impose upon ours, we don't make waves. As long as you don't bring a wave to us, we are people of dignity. We are people of humility and balance. That's what we're supposed to be. That's how those companions were. They were the best of this nation. They're supposed to be our role models. 
We're supposed to be patterning ourselves after them. If we did, we'd have that dignity. If we did, we'd have that humility. If we did, we'd have that balanced. And we'd be able to live anywhere on this earth and be content, not happy. Cause there's no happiness for the believer here. This world ain't no, no, no paradise for us, it's a prison but I can live in contentment I'm anywhere on this earth if I maintain that ideology, that Muslim identity. Y'all understand that? That's how it's supposed to be, okay? All right, so today we're gonna be finishing up volume one of the book that sets it all out for us. We're gonna be completing this book today and there should be no question from any of you as to whether you can celebrate a birthday, as to whether you can celebrate New Year's Day or any non-Muslim holiday. You guys should know why we don't do that. It's not a matter of, 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 does, it, um, of, of does it necessarily uh, have to do with worship. It's a matter of allegiance. Wala wa well better. I disassociate from anything that is not from my way of life. I don't attach myself to any culture other than the culture of Islam, okay? I'm not going to get involved in anything that did not come from my Lord that did not come from my prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that those companions who Allah says are the best of this nation didn't indulge in so this is why we don't celebrate Martin Luther King's day my allegiance is not to Martin Luther King my allegiance is not to African Americans my allegiance is not to the slaves my allegiance is to any person who declares la ilaha illallah muhammad dor rasulullah so you guys set aside one day out the year to commemorate to commemorate martin luther king because he did a lot for people of color here in america he did a lot for people who are minorities in America. That's all good. And we can respect that. Okay. But am I going to take part in your celebration of him? No. Because no matter what good Martin Luther King did, remember all your good deeds are nothing if you die upon anything other than la ilaha illallah. Of all the good things that he did, and no matter how intelligent he may have been, he was not intelligent enough to understand that only Allah is worthy of worship. And we can't say he didn't know about it because he did. So I disassociate myself from Martin Luther King. Y'all understand? Because it ain't got nothing to do with paganism. It ain't got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with allegiance. Y'all got to stop using paganism. Y'all know what the word paganism mean. Paganism means to worship an idol, to worship a God other than a law this ain't got nothing to do martin luther king day ain't got nothing to do with worship it's about uh giving homage to a man who fought for the civil rights in america that's nice but my allegiance ain't to him okay so i'm not gonna participate in that day i'm not gonna send miss Mis, uh, mixed messages. 
out there. I'm a Muslim. I ain't half Muslim and half a uh, 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 Kafir. Yes, it's sad. Yes, it's sad what the African Americans had to endure. Like I said, everybody got a story. The Gazans got a story. Bosnia has a story. America's got a story too. But my allegiance is to a law, to the prophet and to the believers. That's it. Not a tribe, not a race. What happened, happened. We learned from it. Nobody on this planet suffered more than the prophet Muhammad and his companions, not the slaves in America, not even the people in Gaza. Nobody has suffered more than the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those companions. This is life. And Allah is gonna test us with what we can handle. What happened in America, we could handle it. What's happening in Gaza, they can handle it. What happened with the prophet, he could handle it. But where's my allegiance? Y'all understand? This is where we have to separate as Muslims living in the West. A lot of you still are clinging to that race, racial stuff. A lot of you are still clinging, you Arabs, to that tribal stuff. We got to separate that racial stuff, that tribal stuff, and come to La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, which includes Wella Walbera. Y'all understand? You guys should understand this from this book that we, we've covered all of this. Now today, these last three pages, today I'm going to give you the Dalil again, the evidence again, as to why I don't care. You cannot vote in a non-Muslim presidential election. You Muslims put Obama in office. He played upon your ignorance. He got, he knew that the only way that black man could get into that white house was by appealing to the minorities. He played the black man card to get the African Americans to support him. He went to the hip hop artists like Jay-Z Beyonce and them. He went to Nicki Minaj, the rappers, the hip hop community, and got them to go out and get the black people to vote. Then he went to the Mexican community. He talked to the Mex Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, the Spanish people, and got their support. Oh, he knows how to politic. He's a Zionist. Zionists are masters of politicking. He went to the Native American community and he even went to the reservations and got the Native Americans to support him. And then he came up with a big decision. He said, huh, statistics show that one out of every 10 Americans is Muslim. Those Muslims, they don't vote. But you know what? My father was is a Muslim. I come, my father came from a Muslim country. I ain't no Muslim. I'm a I'm what they call an, an apostate. But uh these Muslims are so emotional, I can play on them. I can play on their emotions too. So let me start something that no other president thought to do. Let me hit the African-American massages. Let me pray, play on the fact that I learned Quran when I was a kid. They gonna be too stupid to think I'm an apostate. And that's what he did. 
And that's how he got in the White House, because of all the minorities, because there's more minorities in America than there are Caucasians. He got the Arabs to support him. He went to Brooklyn, New York, got that woman, what's her name? That these women, feminists, Arab, whatever they are, he got her and all the rest of them to support him. He even went down to Texas. Hello, let's keep it real. He went to the famous celebrity so-called scholars in Texas and invited them to the White House for Turkey Day. Told them that they wives are welcome. I know y'all got two, three, four, bring them. Tell them they can even wear their hijab. Oh yeah. He knew how to do it because Zionists are like that. They know how to conquer, divide and destroy. But you Muslims fail for it. I remember we still got people, Muslims, African-American Muslims and Caucasian Muslims walking around talking about, go out and vote. We need to have a voice. We need to be heard. We live in America. We, sh we should be heard. And I kept telling y'all, what does Allah say? Allah says in the Quran, they are never gonna listen to you. Allah says they will never accept you. Allah says they will never have your, your, your interests at heart. But y'all didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to Sheikh Atli. You didn't listen to Kareem Abouze. You know, y'all listen to those other famous brothers from out of Texas. Y'all listen to them. Okay. And y'all went to the polls and voted this man in. Talking, thinking that y'all got a voice. We should be heard. When all he did was laugh and send, sign the bills, sending all of that, those bombs to Israel. Okay? Idiots. Well, today we're going to talk about it. You know, Allah is clear. Like I tell y'all, there's no gray areas in this religion when it comes to the lawful and the unlawful. Voting in a non-Muslim election for a leader is haram, haram, haram. Allah says it in the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad says it in numerous hadiths. And Allah even goes further to tell y'all they don't care about your voice. Your voice will never be heard. So let's put the PowerPoint up for today. And by the way, for the people on uh, my Zoom room, I'm going to be sharing y'all to YouTube, I mean to Twitter. And just so y'all know, we're streaming on Instagram. You can just type my name, Layla Nasheba. I'm also streaming on Twitter, Twitch, Trovo, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere. So many, uh, LinkedIn. Every, everywhere just about, but I'm going to share them to um, Twitter today so I can see the Twitter people's comments. Hold on, guys. Hold on. This is Twitter. Okay. Now let me, for you guys here, let me switch the camera to my PowerPoint for everybody else. So just give me a second. Where's my uh, camera? Okay. Hold on. Okay, here I come. Give me a second. Y'all know I don't have anybody to work my cameras for me. So I have to work my. <sighs> my own camera. This is me. Oh, okay. I hit the wrong button. Okay. I see what I'm supposed to do. Hold on, guys. I got the wrong button. Here we are. This is what I'm supposed to be sharing to y'all. I got confused. You know, I have a. Uh, anxiety okay everybody can see that okay this is the powerpoint for today and please guys take screenshots like my students do when i put the don't take screenshot this because i haven't started it up really yet but when i uh do the powerpoints when i complete it take a screenshot with your cell phone then you can print it out at the end of the class and staple it together so it'll be a little booklet and then you can clip it to page 
352 of the book so you will have it to as an explanation for what uh, is being discussed there. So let me now switch to make this even larger for you guys. Give me a second from the beginning. Woo! Can y'all see that? Okay. Everybody can see, inshallah. Yeah, we can see. Okay, good. So today is going to be pages 352 to the end of the book. Well, 354. And we're going to speak about how appointing non-Muslims as people of authority over us is haram, haram, haram. Okay, Allah says it, it's haram. It, like I said, the law for an unlawful is clear. Ain't no in between. And you can't change the law's laws. You can't say because this is 2024 and you in America, you wanna have your voice heard. Your voice ain't never gonna be heard here. And by the way, they ain't gonna hear your voice in no Muslim country either. So just shut up. Half of the time we need to shut up anyway, because most of us don't, don't know what to say when we talk anyway. Just shut up. <clears throat> and instead focus on saving your soul and your children from the hellfire. Okay, so everybody take a screenshot of this because this is the first page. I'm giving y'all time. Everybody got the screenshot. Now we go to the second page. Here we go. Don't screenshot this yet, though. I'll tell y'all when to screenshot it. Okay, I want everybody. A people ask me, Sister Layla, what is your dalil? What is your evidence that we cannot vote in an election uh, for a non-Muslim? Well, I usually give them the hadith because the prophet is clear in the hadith. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says a non-Muslim can never be a ruler or guardian over a Muslim. That's why even when a woman gets married, we can't have a Christian wali. The woman's guardian has to be Muslim. I usually give them that, but I'm going to make it even clearer. I'm going to give you this verse of the Quran. Listen to what Allah says. And the next time y'all hear those brothers from out of Texas, because that's where many of them are. We also got a few in Philadelphia. We got a few, I, I also I understand it in New York, not from Brooklyn, but um, what's that place, Geechee? Some other place in New York, a couple of famous brothers talking about it's okay to vote in elections because we need to have our voices heard and we need to be represented. Where well, you on you on a pipe dream. You know how the non-Muslims say you smoking on a pipe dream? You pipe dreaming because listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Oh, you who believe. Y'all see that? Whenever you read a verse of the Quran that begins with, oh, you who believe, that means Allah is getting ready to tell you something important. If you truly believe in him, you will submit to this because that's what Muslim means. Muslim means one who submits. You will submit to this verse here if you are a believer. If you are a, not a believer, if you have hypocrisy in your heart, you won't submit. So those brothers that's telling y'all that you need to get your voice heard, you should know they got some something in their heart. They ain't oh you who believe. Because if they were oh you who believe, they submit. We don't call them kafir. We just tell them that there's something wrong with them in their Akita. They got some Akita issues. And anybody with an Akita issue can't tell me nothing because Akita, everything begins with and ends with that. If your Akita is not correct, none of your deeds is accepted. So you can't tell me nothing, brother, because your Akita ain't right. So Allah says, oh, you who believe, do not take as your advisors or consultants or protectors, or leaders, or helpers, or friends, those outside your religion. 
because they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. Y'all see that? Allah goes on to say they desire to harm you severely. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths, but what their hearts conceal is even worse. And we have made this plain to you. If you are a person of understanding, this verse here, this is your dalil. This is the evidence that you can never, ever, 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 I don't care if it was 20,000 and 10,024, ever participate in presidential elections and vote for a non-Muslim. Y'all see that? It's clear. The Allah is telling you, all they want to do is hurt you and they will do their best to corrupt you. Look what Obama did to you ignorant Muslims who voted. The Turkey people from Texas, you signed the bill making LGBTQ legal. You Muslims are gonna have to be accountable for that. Did y'all know that? All of you who voted for Obama, you made homosexuality lawful. Allah is gonna ask y'all about that. Y'all better repent. You sent the bombs to Israel because that's what Obama did. He sent them bombs over there, been sending them for four years when he was president. So you play the role in what's going on. You crying. Like I said, the people in Gaza don't need your sympathy. They know that you sent them bombs to them. You ain't fooling them. You fooling yourself because they would have told you the people in Gaza know it's haram to participate in elections. They don't participate in the Zionist elections where they live. They don't do that. They know that this is a big sin. They already know that, the, that no non-Muslim will ever, ever have our interests at heart because they hate us. Allah has told us that. And Allah is telling us he made it plain. But most of you don't understand. Y'all see why there's going to be more people in hell than paradise? More Muslims in hell. Let me talk about that for a minute. Hold on. How do I get this screen? I'm getting ready to take it down because I got a big point here to make y'all. Hold on. Hold on. I, I just remembered. I got to explain that hadith. Uh, I got to explain this hadith that the brothers are mis, mis, misinterpreting the meaning of. Let me go to this, because I just, some famous brothers, oh yeah, they misinterpreting this hadith. How do I do Zoom meeting? Go, hold on, I'm coming back. Here we go. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, there will be more people in hell than paradise. He said, out of every 1,000 people you know, 999 will be in hell. And only one of that thousand will make it to paradise. Let me, this hadith is authentic. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and also uh, uh, in other sita too. But a lot of you Muslims here, because you don't know the history of Islam, you don't speak Fusha, you don't understand the meaning, you break the meaning, and, and I hear a lot of Muslims, y'all take that hadith and you try to put it with another one. There's another hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the Gog and the Magog would make up the difference. People don't know, this is the same kutba. Those hadiths are not separate. You have to know what happened. What happened to make the prophet say that? What was going on? That was all the same kutba. Let me give y'all the true meaning. Hello. 
every day the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go to the mosque at Fajr, lead the Muslims in prayer at Fajr. And then after praying Fajr, he would ask the people, are there any questions? Or does anybody have any dreams that they want me to interpret for them? Because being a prophet, he was able to interpret dreams. And this was after a week ago, he had spent the whole day and night talking about the signs of the last hour, which included him speaking about the Gog and the Magog. So, one of the companions said, yes, I have a question. He said, you said that out of every 1,000 people we know, 999 of them will be in hell and only one will make it to paradise. He said, oh, prophet of Allah, we were talking about it amongst ourselves. There's not even a thousand of us here because this is when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had migrated to Medina, okay? The Muslims were few in numbers. So one of the companions said, we don't even have, there's not even a thousand of us here. They say, he said, so we're afraid, oh prophet. We think that we're all gonna be in hell. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laughed. And he said, no, no, you are my companions. Are upon the traditional Islam. And that's when he went on and talked about how, don't you know this nation will divide into over 73 sets? All of them will be in the hellfire, except for the one who sticks upon the traditional Islam. And then one of the companions said, well, what's the traditional Islam? The prophet said, the traditional Islam is what I am upon, is what you are upon, and it's what those first four that come after me will be upon. He said, don't you know that the Gog and the Magog will make up the difference of for you? They said for each, he said for each and every one of you, my companions, you will be the one and there will be 999 Gog and Magog to make up the difference. That's the meaning of that Hadith. And the true scholars, which are few of Hadith will tell you I'm speaking correctly cause I learned it from them. The meaning from them. Cause I was like you guys when I was young, running around thinking that I'm gonna be in paradise because a Gog and a Magog is gonna, no. That Hadith is only for his companions. The Hadagog and the Magog will make up the difference for his companions. They will be the one and the Gog and the Magog will be the 999. And by the way, the prophet had thousands of companions. He had thousands of companions. He didn't just have five. There were thousands of companions. So for you Muslims, y'all listen to these uneducated, y'all listen to these uneducated, I repeat, these uneducated, famous celebrity Muslim speakers, talk about the dean when they don't understand it. Because like the prophet said, you will never, ever, ever understand this dean till you learn those hadiths and they ain't learned them. They don't know them. They too old to learn them. You gotta start when you a baby, subhanAllah, okay? And you have to have teachers to teach you the meaning. It don't matter what language you speak, you gotta know the meaning. I don't speak Arabic fluently, but I know the meaning because my teacher spoke Fusai. 
And I had translators to give me the meaning. SubhanAllah. Y'all understand that? So don't sit around getting it twisted, thinking that, well, I'm going to be in paradise because I heard Mufti so-and-so. Oh, I heard Sheikh so-and-so. Oh, I heard Imam so-and-so say that the Gog and the Magog will make it up for us. No, that hadith is about the prophet's companions. They will be the 999 to make the difference of his companions. Not you, not me. Because most of us are not upon the traditional Islam. Most of us are not upon it. You say you are. We say that we practice Islam with the understanding of the companions, but we don't. We're practicing Islam with the understanding of a sheikh, not the companions. And you prove it when people ask you a question, you say what a sheikh said. Instead of saying what those original companions said, like I do. Okay, most of these people have not learned this religion properly, guys. I don't care what schools they go to. You can graduate from El Azhar. So what? A lot of numbskulls. You can graduate from Medina. So what? Numbskulls. You can graduate from Mecca. So what? A numbskull. A lot of numbskulls. They don't understand. They are because they don't have the understanding of those companions. We're supposed to have, in order to be upon the correct belief system, I want y'all to listen to me. In order to be upon the correct belief system, your understanding of this deen should be like the companions, those original, I'm talking Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Ibn Abbas, Aisha, Um, Salama, their understanding. If your understanding contradicts theirs, you're lost because Allah said that. What's my dalil? Allah said that. He said the best of this nation are those who are with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then those that come after them. And those that come after them. Period. Dot. Kaput. Y'all understand? So don't be twisted. Don't be deluded by these famous speakers. The same ones that had you going to the White House. Putting Obama in because he black. He from Somali. He <laughs> Don't be duped by those idiots. Y'all understand that? Remember, Islam, the, the religion, Islam will become strange. And what will make it strange? The death of the true scholar. The real scholars, when they die, they take their knowledge with them and they leave behind a bunch of renegades. Okay? Seriously. The scholars of Hadith are few. They're few. The scholars of Fusha are few. That's why I cling. I claim the Sheikh Mustafa Morsi Abu Adaya because I know when he's gone, when Sheikh Morsi goes, Layla will be lost. I already lost two. I lost Umar El Ashkar. Oh, I lost Carter Dari. Oh, what will I do if I lose Mustafa Morsi? Scholars of Hadith. Man, get it together. All right. So that hadith about God and my God don't apply to you and me because we ain't no companion. It applies to the, those thousands. And there were thousands. Jamali can talk about that one day with y'all. Because by the way, that's Jamali is another one. 
His specialty is Hadith. Just to let y'all know. Yeah, I know Jamali's got sick, but I'm going to tell y'all. Jamali, what brought him here to Sunnah followers? And why has Jamali been here? Because his specialty is Hadith too. The science of Hadith. He learned them Hadith when he was a kid too. You got to learn them when you're a kid like we, he was, like I was. Because when you're a child, you can soak it in. Okay? He's another one of the few scholars of Hadith. Okay? So, and he can talk more to y'all about how many, there were thousands of companions. And those Gog and the Magog will make up for them, not you, not me. Okay? So stop listening to those famous little boys from out of the UK. And stop listening to those idiots from down there in Texas that's telling y'all otherwise, who done told y'all to go and vote for Obama, and y'all listened. Okay? All right, let's put the PowerPoint back up. Yeah, I got to keep it real. This is called real talk. As a diet, we don't sugarcoat. The Prophet Muhammad didn't sugarcoat. The Prophet Muhammad had a very loud voice. He didn't speak in a whisper. He spoke with a very loud voice. He sounded like the Godfather. He also had a hoarseness. Can y'all imagine that? Being loud like this? Oh, my God. The true diet. Oh, yeah. We don't sugarcoat. We're going to tell you what you need to hear. We're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We don't care what you think about how we're presenting it because there's no, no nice way to present the truth. The truth is always a bitter pill for man to swallow. Allah says that. So I don't care. I can make my voice sound like with, with some British accent and, and, and what joy and do the Marilyn Monroe too. You still ain't, if the truth is a hard pill to swallow. Okay, y'all better learn this Dean the correct way. Be careful who you learning from because somebody got a million followers. I want y'all to know the most famous person, the most famous thing is Shaitan. Shaitan got more followers than any of us. And he will have his grandstand on the day of judgment. So stop being duped by these speakers on YouTube with millions of followers. That should tell you right there. The fact that they got millions mean, uh-oh, that's a bad sign. He must be telling them what they want to hear. Not what they need to hear. Y'all understand? That's common sense. Figure it out, people. All right, so let's get back to this lecture. Let's get back to it. I had, I had to get that hadith explained because it bothers me when I hear you guys use that hadith about the Gog and the Magog to think that it's going to put you in paradise. No, it's talking about, that is about the prophet's companions, not you and me, not that hadith. Okay. All right. Let's get back to um, this, the PowerPoint. Hold on. I'm switching it. Bear with me, guys. I don't have nobody to help me. Hold on. Allow. Then I go back here to this. Big screen it. Put it on full screen. Oh, let me take my name down too. Okay. There you go. Full screen. And I'm going to give you all the rest of that verse. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Go here. This is me. Yeah. Okay. Click on. Uh, uh, what am I doing? Oh. Current. Okay. So. As you guys can see, a law is clear. And I want y'all to take the screenshot. Now I'm going to put up the whole thing up. A law is clear. He says, oh, you who believe, do not take as advisors, rulers, helpers, protectors, consultants, friends, those outside your religion, because they will never fail to do their best to corrupt you. Their desire is to hurt you severely. And hatred has already appeared from their mouths, but what their hearts hold is even worse. And Allah is telling us he made this plain to us if we would just submit to it, accept it, and understand this. 
So whenever we fail to implement allegiance and disassociation as a law commands us to do, and by the way, I'm going to share it. Hold on. I know the people on my Zoom room, they said they don't see. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here, there it is. Now y'all see it. Whenever we fail to um, uh, 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 put into action true allegiance and disassociation, you know, this is when we end, end up losing our Muslim identity and we end up corrupt. And Allah is emphasizing here that we should never take non-Muslims as close associates because they do things, their lifestyle is not like us. They cheat, they lie, they betray, okay? They support LGBTQ. They support drugs. They support murder and all that stuff. And the one thing about them is they will hide their true intentions, just like Obama did. They will hide their true intentions. They will hide their true feelings and use you for their agenda. So here in this verse, Allah is telling us to be cautious and to safeguard our faith by avoiding getting too close to them. Like I said, we live in here, we live in America, we obey the laws, we don't transgress the laws here. We don't go around hurting people. But I know when to hold and I know when to fold. I'll help my neighbors. If my neighbors need help, I don't care if they're Muslim or not, I'm gonna help them. But I am not gonna participate in their gatherings. I am not gonna participate in their elections of presidents either. Because the simple fact that that president is not a Muslim, Allah has already told me that they'll never have my interests in heart. So I'm not going to support them in any of that. I will respect your laws. I will not violate your laws, but I am not going to violate mine either. Do you guys understand that? I've been Muslim all my life. I was born in the USA. Hit it, Bruce. You know, the boss. They called me boss lady back in the day. I was born in the USA, but I have never participated in no presidential election and never will. And I'm 62 years old because I already knew this. My mother and stepfather and community raised me up on this. They'll never have our interests at heart. Okay. Also, one of the early scholars, Imam El Tabari, he was also one of the scholars of Hadith. He explains that, the, that this verse highlights the dangers of associating with the non-Muslims like that and the harm that we can get from that. And take a screenshot. Here it is. So appointing non-Muslims as judges, rulers, or authorities over us, haram. It goes against that verse that Allah uh, put there for us. And I want to share something that happened. Like I tell you guys, there is nothing that we experience in this world today that those companions have not experienced. Let me share something that happened during the time of Umar. But let's first look at this verse here. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, never will Allah give a victory to the unbelievers over the believers. Now, for those Muslims here in America who say that they're going to vote, they say, well, we need to have a voice. If we don't have a voice, they can do all kind of stuff to us. First of all, Allah tells you, you can voice your opinion all you want to. They ain't going to consider it. And also Allah lets us know here that he will never allowed the unbelievers to triumph over us. Remember the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua asking Allah for four things. One of the things he asked Allah was to never allow the Muslims to be destroyed by their enemies. Allah answered that. This hadith is authentic. It's in Muslim. Allah says, I will never allow the enemies to destroy and overpower the Muslims 
He said, but your destruction will come from yourselves. You will kill and fight and destroy yourselves. So Allah lets us know we don't have to vote in no elections. I don't have to vote for no president because Allah already told me that he'll never allow the non-Muslims to triumph over us. I don't care. A Kafir can, can run for president right now saying he's going to stop the war in Palestine. You're stupid if you believe him, number one, because America's a Zionist country. That's part of their constitution. Number two, Allah already says he's in control of the war. Allah's in control, not America. Voting for a president here in America ain't got nothing to do with what's going to happen over there in, in Gaza. Allah is in control of that. And Allah has promised us that our victory will come. As Dr. Jamali said yesterday when he was talking to y'all, one day our victory will come because Allah promised that. So I wanted to share that verse and now I'm gonna share something else that happened with the companions. During the caliphate of Umar, Radiallahu anha. Abu Musa Ashari, he was the governor. Uh, I think the governor, uh, 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 he was the governor of one of the places in, in uh, Syria, and I think he was the governor of Yemen. He was the governor of Yemen. He came to Umar and told Umar that he had appointed a Christian to be his secretary. Because Abu Musa Shari was like the governor and he appointed a Christian to be his secretary. When he told Umar that, Umar said, Supana Allah, Allah tells us in the interpretation of the meaning, oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and Christians as friends, protectors, helpers, or rulers because they are only that to each other. And he says, if you do, then you are one of them. And Allah will never guide a person or a people who is a wrongdoer. So Umar told Abu Musa Shari, why would you appoint a non-Muslim as your secretary? When this verse emphasizes that Allah will never uh, uh, allow the non-Muslims to triumph over us. So since they'll never triumph over us, you don't have to uh, kiss up to them. Kiss up to them that way. And I'm going to tell you all the history. This is when the uh, Umar had defeated the Romans. The Romans were a Christian uh, nation. So they had were converting to Islam. Abu Musa Shari was a, 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 the governor of Yemen. So he thought that by appointing one of the Christians to be a secretary, it would make the people, you know, be more supportive of the Muslim regime. And that's why Umar told him, you didn't have, don't do that. This is haram. Plus, remember, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the Christians rebelling and overpowering you because Allah will never allow them to triumph over us, okay? That's the story behind that. So Umar reprimanded Abu Musa Shari for appointing that Christian as a secretary, reminding him that Allah forbids this. And that's when he told him, remove him and instead appoint a Muslim as your secretary. And don't worry about the people rebelling against you because Allah promises he'll never allow the unbelievers to triumph over us. So here we can see, guys, I tell you all, take a screenshot of this. I tell you guys all the time, there is nothing that we are experiencing today that those companions have not already encountered. They've given us the way to handle ourselves in good times, in bad times. 
The problem is we don't learn about them. We don't know about them. We don't try to learn about them. We don't try to get to know about them because we're too caught up in our own desires. It's all about what makes us happy as Muslims because we want to be accepted by the non-Muslims. We want to blend in. We want to be acknowledged by them. Y'all see that? So there's all the Dalil, all the Dalil. Again, the lawful and unlawful is clear. Those were clear verses letting you know you can never appoint them in positions of leadership over us or with us, not even as a secretary, because they'll never ever have our uh, uh, good, they will never have our welfare at heart. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here. Supana kala huma wa bi hamdika a shadow on laila haila anta stop the ruko wa tubu lake. Are there any questions or comments? This is a lot of of uh, powerful stuff here, but everything I'm teaching is based on Quran and Hadith, not no imam's opinion, not no fatwa on mine. It's clear. Y'all should have listened to me. You should have listened to Shay Atley. Should have listened to Kareem Abu Zayn when we were telling y'all about that voting. No, y'all called us radical extremists. Crazy. Y'all referred to me as being a crazy, loud woman. Well, I'm supposed to be loud. And yeah, I'll be crazy too. But perhaps you dislike something that Allah brings a lot of good from. Check that out. Questions, go ahead.